Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to TPA Global's webinar. Today on topic, uh, where is BEPS today? Uh, my name is Lin Lin, and I will be your moderator for this session. Uh, in the session today, we have presenters Raymond Gerardu and Igna Valu Tita as our speakers for today's topic. Uh, Raymond is the Chief Commercial Officer of TPA Global. He has over 25 years experience in the tax and transfer pricing fields, performed roles in both advisory and industry. Prior to joining TPA Global, Raymond was a senior relationship partner at KPMG, managing global and regional key accounts. Before that, he was the global head of tax of a Swiss-based 20 billion euro company where he was mandated to set up and manage the global tax department from scratch. Um, about IGNA, um, IGNA is a transfer pricing specialist at TPA and has experience in transfer pricing, risk management, and performance improvement. Her previous experience includes two years as a management consultant in Lithuania and the Netherlands with a focus on business processes and procedures, redesign, performance measurement, risk management, planning, and strategy formulation. In her current role, she provides consultancy services within the broad professional scope of TPA practice with a strong focus on tax risk management, TP documentation, benchmarking, and royalty rate determination. Um, so during today's session, if you have any questions, feel free to type uh, your questions in the questions or chat box. Uh, we will pick up the questions and address them uh, during the end of the uh, presentation at our Q&A session. Um, today's webinar will be recorded. Uh, we will upload the uh, slides and the recording to our website, tpa-global.com, and uh, we will also send you an email when the materials are available for download. So now I give the floor to Raymond. Thank you, Ling. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar of TPA Global. Um, if we go to the content slide, uh, what is it that we want to, uh, to share with you today? We will look at why we have the discussion around BEPS at all. What are its key features and uh, what is the current status as we know it? And where do we think it might be going? Finally, IGNA will take you through what we call a risk-based methodology that we tend to apply uh, with our clients to, to run a quick test to see where that specific client stands in terms of BEPS, and we call it BEPS readiness test, if you will. Next slide, please, Neil. Yeah. Just to give you a bit of context, where is it all coming from? As you can see here, this is how we tend to look at tax and transfer pricing from a governance point of view. Um, and in principle, it has the three components control goals. How do you control and manage them? How do you communicate them? Uh, above all, uh, if you look at the top right-hand side, the corporate government governance according OCD is basically a set of relations between management, board, shareholders, and other stakeholders. Um, it basically tries thus to connect all these three dimensions, but moreover, it is influenced heavily by the needs of its share and stakeholders. And if we look at the stakeholders on the next slide, can we get to the next slide, please? This is the way we look at it is the board of the company has a big challenge to help the organization to align with all stakeholders' expectation. For today, I don't want to take you through all of them, but you will recognize uh, some of what we refer to as the typical st stakeholders of a company. Uh, needless to say, you know, it may vary from company to company, from organization to organization. Uh, privately owned may have different ones versus public versus uh, non-profit organizations. But many of them you can find in, in every organization. And we will focus for today very quickly on the number three and eight, which are the highlighted version, the tax authorities, politicians, and number eight, public society, which is basically you and I as well. You no doubt have 
as tax specialist, heard of the UK hearings where in 2012 there was a lot of grilling done on uh, you know, the representatives of the Starbucks of this world, the Google and Amazon, on their activities where they have large sales operations or large production operations in a country but pay little tax. Um, but it's not only 2012 at the height of uh, the financial crisis, but also if we look at very recent activities in 2014, the LuxLeaks are now famous, where a lot of information was disclosed on how companies effectively try to manage their tax rates. Um, and even more recent in May of this year, the Euro Commission is now checking into McDonald's uh, in its what they refer to the tax operating structure that they applied and they claim that between 09 and 13 there was a 1 billion euro ticket in terms of taxes avoided by McDonald's. So you see that suddenly authorities are really, really eager to get a better understanding of what is happening in the tax land with multinationals and that it was being effectively the big trigger for BEPS plus obviously in connection the, the public outcry if you look at public society who wants to have a fair share of taxes paid by everybody you know people individuals who pay their taxes can't understand why a company is not paying taxes or not paying enough taxes so that triggers BEPS the BEPS project in the political scenery if we go to the next slide please for many of you a known entity but just to, to give you a bit of snapshot what we believe the main goals of BEPS are of the BEPS initiative clearly governments want to have more information about what tax authorities are doing they want to have everything to the extent possible there is also a drive to walk away from maybe um, legal reality versus economic substance reality they want to see where there is people there should also be taxes paid by a company in concept the initiative is to clearly reduce tax leakages um, as I mentioned before tax people can do very smart things in this world they can allocate risks in a proper way uh, to, to locations where there's maybe low tax and have the residual going there. Clearly, that's what tax authorities try to avoid. They want to get anti-avoidance measures, new structures in place, new requirements in place to avoid it. Uh, think about the, uh, the hybrid mismatch discussions. They just don't want to have it anymore. Uh, there's also quite a promotion of broadening of the taxable base if you think about the disallowance of uh, interest expenses as an example if you think about the attribution of income to PEs or non PEs as we have them today they want to change that and last but not least there is a there is a drive in action 15 to go to a multilateral instrument which hopefully for the authorities will be in place to create a level playing field over all the parties all the countries that are part of the BEPS initiative in the next year or two uh, rather than have legislation left right center coming from individual countries with individual in interpretations so that's in essence the way we look at uh, the main goals of the BEPS initiative let's go to the next slides what is really happening now I don't want to read you all these words that are in there and actually while we were writing them we also realized we cannot do it comprehensively nor do you probably want to have it comprehensively because you no doubt are reading all the material which is already a mountain to to climb so why what we try to do here is just to take some high-level uh, statements on where we think um, on these specific action points they're going if we look at action point number one clearly that is tackling the Amazons and Googles of this world um, they're looking at you know where are the marketing support functions in what country are they how should we allocate uh, income to all relevant elements of what is considered to be value drivers of digital economy um, 
there is a statement about what is the economic substance by pe reflected by people functions that's going to give in our view quite some contention uh, which will drive a lot of discussion uh, the PE concept is obviously going to be one that's going to be relevant here so there's still a lot uncertainty in this area and um, but we can already see the PE concept the relevance of substance or people functions um, but also what seems to be a new concept of the digital pre presence or call it significant digital presence which is a new concept which will create some some uncertainty as well if you we go to the hybrid mismatch number two um, that is a, a clear message that we're getting all over the place where there is a mismatch, a mismatch when you have a hybrid instrument that results in deduction on the one end and no income on the other end or where you have double deduction or you have a indirect deduction and no inclusion as it is called this is clearly an area where tax payers tax consultants have been working on over the past years in, in implementing needless to say this is a burden for tax authorities but that's the way the systematic rules work in each and every country so they want to actually get rid of it so I would have to expect that this is going to be their goal we see for instance that Spain has already introduced rules around this I can imagine that more countries will do this if OECD is not finalizing uh, it's it's um, it's attack on this which has to come through the action 15 the multilateral instrument number three the CFC rules many countries have CFC rules um, there are countries that are introducing it like Chile who has uh, introduced it a couple of years ago um, in my mind uh, more countries will try to do it to avoid the use of low tax jurisdiction so it's going to be more a shall I say an anti avoidance uh, drive but it's a serious one and it is all aimed at no versus high taxation place of uh, multinationals anyway number four we already know from many countries that there is limitation in interest deductions uh, debt equity rules percentages of EBIT etc they are all, all over the place what is happening now obviously is that there is a lot of discussion around what is the right approach formula driven economic approach um, there's obviously working parties of the OECD in it involved in number 11 number six um, the, the whole story the way we can see it is that it can create quite some distortion on how big multinationals finance their organization and it does have a very high level of risk of double taxation because if you don't have a deduction in one but you have interest pickup in the other uh, it potentially could lead to organizations moving away from intercompany loan financing and going into equity finance where the question is that limiting flexibility etc so there, there is quite some issue in that in that arena uh, also with the individual countries we see a lot of movement in this area to name a few South Africa for the start of this year China announced a you know a, a an approach in uh, in March of this year and we can still expect more countries to come at least that's my expectation here number five counter harmful tax practices I think there is a lot of uh, individual rulings in this world in multiple countries possible some of them are very straightforward others are very exotic I think this is fitting within the need of authorities to understand what kind of rulings are effectively in this world available which countries issue them how do they play into uh, the competition to attract business into one versus another country so in my mind there, there is a lot to say about all these special deals in countries that could disappear very very rapidly uh, because you can imagine the the pressure that is on Luxembourg with LuxLeaks is a very high political pressure and I could expect other countries to get also a lot of other pressure so 
we almost have to assume that a lot of these, I would refer them a little bit, maybe not rightfully so, but just to take the position, uh, abandon these private ruling regimes and go back to standard uh, way of applying the, uh, the tax rules in the country. There is also clearly a lot of discussion around spontaneous exchange of information between authorities. This is obviously, again, a means of authorities to get more information, also from peer organizations in other countries, with the aim of creating that level playing field, and meaning you cannot have any more the opportunity to play the different country rules as much as you may be able to do today, yesterday, and a couple of years ago. And number six, in my humble view, this is a very scary one. We talk about the prevention of treaty abuse. Uh, Canada is planning, for instance, as one of the countries to start introducing uh, rules around treaty abuse in line with the suggestions made in the report last year uh, by OECD. Uh, if you look at the overarching principles that is being laid down in the, uh, in, in the report of last year with the limitation on benefit rules that have been introduced there and moreover the principal purpose test, it can become a very uh, acrebic type of document at the end for any multinational because if you have planned your legal structure in such a way that your income streams out of interest, out of royalties for trade names and for IP rights, technical rights, whatever you have, in such a way that you can apply a treaty between the payor and the payee such that you have a reduction on withholding taxes, you might find yourself in a bit of a strange situation if a tax authority starts to hit you with the principal purpose test. It's becoming to a certain extent a bit subjective at the minimum and probably at the starting point of any audit. So this is an area where obviously it's going to be quite relevant for you to really understand your legal structure and really have your arguments ready for any withholding tax reduction that you're claiming under a treaty. Um, on the other hand, we also have to say that it will only be valid to the extent authorities can agree with other countries to implement it in their respective tax treaties or alternatively the Big Bang approach through Action 15, the multilateral instrument. The jury is still out obviously, but it's one of those which is um, a sheep in a wolf skin to me. Number seven, prevent artificial avoidance of PE status. We obviously have the famous UK uh, diverted profit tax which is in place where the UK unilateral just said, I don't want this anymore, I want to have legislation and I want to curb this type of uh, structuring where people are using the treaty to just say, oh, this is not a PE, thank you very much, and I don't pay tax anymore. So that's clearly a, a message that is uh, hitting the OECD BAPS initiative, not in a nice way. Um, Australia, last week, I think it was the 12th of May, also announced its own legislation to do something similar, where they also want to make sure that income that in particular is transferred from Australia to say Singapore, that you know they want to keep part of that income in Australia. So we, we see movements on a global scale where countries are starting to protect their tax base absent of solid proposal and rules around this uh, coming from the OECD or maybe even should I say consensus coming through the BEPS initiative. Number eight, nine and ten, if I can just take them all a bit together. There's a lot of discussion around how you document, how you need to look at economic substance versus your risk management. There is a new statement around the conduct of the individuals that perform certain functions. So there is a lot of focus coming around substance, risk, conduct, and effectively are these people actually doing that? And 
I sometimes like to see an example where two people sit on the beautiful island of Bermuda where the company claims that they make all the decisions, hold all the powers and are really the kings of the world, whereas there is a whole R&D center of 50 people sitting in Germany where all the brains are, all the development is done. Suddenly the question comes, okay, but where's now the value creation? We all know how the rules could work uh, until maybe today, but that's obviously something that authorities want to curb. So it means that more and more tax is going to get closer and closer to business. We'll walk away a bit more from the tax, tax, technical, legal stuff and go more into the actual economic world and closer to business. So I think for tax people, it is absolutely mandatory to get a better understanding how a business is really run who is really making decisions, where is the value driver of your organization really, where does that person sit or these people sit, and then to be able to justify the allocation of income in a proper way to these organizations, which means you're going to have to document again. So your documentation requirements are increasing just by the very nature of that. Go to the next page, number 11. The improving of the analysis of BAPS, that's more for internal purposes between, organ, between the countries. So I'm not going to hit that more, but it is again about how do they analyze data, how do they deal, how do tax authorities deal with a, the with a heavy load of data coming to them. The one scary part is that they will still be monitoring and see if their actions are very successful, yes or no, to the extent that they are not successful they will come up with new policy measures, or at least that should be the aim of it. So maybe BEPS is here to stay. Um, if we go to number 12, the mandatory disclosure of aggressive tax planning. Again, an area of you know, where tax authorities really want specific type of transactions to be reported by the taxpayer, and where tax authorities really want to get a handle on how do tax or how do multinationals, I should say, uh, manage their tax rate through um, uh, aggressive structures? If you think about it, there is already the, uh, the organization of JITSIC, which is uh, the Joint International Tax Shelter Info Center run by the US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and China, who has been already for a couple of years been looking at all these kind of planning tools that companies apply. Again, it's a means of getting information. It's a means of understanding better how taxpayers manage their tax rates. And it is about curbing those kind of what they refer to as non, uh, shall I say, accepted uh, ways of, uh, of, of reducing taxes. Number 13. The re-examine of the transfer pricing documentation and CBC, I think that's probably an area where everybody is now hovering over because it means a hell of a lot more documentation in terms of financial data in the, uh, in the CBC, the country-by-country uh, -country reporting arena, which means tax suddenly has to look to the finance organization to get all the relevant data points and probably finance is not ready to deliver them all in the way re requested. So it means a, a, a big operational issue in the finance organization to be able to run the reports as requested here. The one thing that is um, to us always a bit of the, the scary piece is in the way that you're going to have to report. Yes, we know your reporting will only come up as of the 1st of January 2017, but it relates to the financial year starting 1 January 2016, which is only seven months ahead of us. In other words, any activities that you have as per 1st of January 16 in your legal structure, in your tax structure, anything that is under attack through one of these action points, it will probably pop up in the reporting in 17, meaning you may have to do already some remediation now, although there is no conclusive way of saying that everything that BEPS is trying to attack will actually pass through and has an effect in, uh, in 16, but the reporting will be there. So that's a word of caution. On the other hand, there is a number of countries that are already 
trying to force their um, their companies to, to to move on CBC as well uh, in their specific ways. UK I mentioned, Spain, uh, just in, as a couple of examples, and maybe there will be more following. And number fourteen, um, there's an obvious uh, balancing act. There is an expectation of more challenges from multiple jurisdictions, if you will, on audit, which means one country is claiming more than maybe it should get, whereas the other is claiming the same, double taxation issues. So dispute resolution, mutual agreement procedures, all these kind of things are absolutely needed to not get into the risk of tax authorities having, sorry, the, the taxpayers having to be hit by double taxation, which is absolutely a big risk given the way this, uh, this process momentarily is running. Number 15, last but not least, this would be sort of the icing on the cake if the OECD BEPS plan will come to fruition and if they're actually successful for every country part of the BEPS initiative to sign up to it, that would be a major strike. It would mean that all the tax treaties amongst these countries will be overridden by this uh, multilateral instrument and it will hit also in particular elements like the treaty uh, the, pre the, 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 the treaty abuse action 6 which will then introduce the limitation of benefits rule under every t treaty and the principal purpose test under every treaty if it is implemented in the way that the report was written last year so this is obviously a very big one and needless to say they're planning another two years to maybe get this thing negotiated, etc. So let's see where they're going. If we go to number, the next slide, sorry. The timelines. We obviously have seen in 14 certain, uh, certain reports delivered this year. There's a number of reports waiting to be, uh, be finalized and, and uh, others to be added. Um, I think the, the mandate on the multilateral instrument, as I mentioned earlier, is there. So that was agreed in February of this year. Um, the country by country is, is more or less agreed. And the preferential treatment regimes for intellectual property, whether they're harmful or not under Action 5, there have been a number of discussions on what is accepted and what is not, which brings the Nexus uh, discussion to play. Um, but overall, there is a, a high expectation that there will be some tsunami of uncoordinated local actions by countries where they will start to try to protect their tax base if OECD is not capable of keeping the coordinated approach alive. The fact that Australia introduced its own rules last week which were heavily contested by uh, the OECD in earlier political conversations. The activities that are going on, or shall I say lack of activities maybe going on in the US in this arena, are they stalling, are they not stalling, is not necessarily helping the OECD to give the picture of a very coordinated and uh, mutually consensus approach that we saw in the first round of publications initially. Now the heat is on and we could expect if that is not coordinated and not agreed in a joined up way that countries will try to protect their uh, tax base and they will come up with unilateral uh, regulations to, to protect the, the ones like uh, the UK did, Australia and probably others. With that, I want to give the word to uh, to Igne, who will give you a bit of an overview on how we look at our clients when we try to assess what kind of BEPS risk they run and how we approach it, um, and that's the BEPS readiness test. So with this, I'll hand it over to Igne. Uh, thank you, Raymond. And uh, as Raymond already discussed in the first part of the of the webinar, OCD has put a lot of effort already to curb tax avoidance through uh, uh, its BEPS, BEPS initiative. Um, uh, so BEPS has arrived, and, and we need to admit that it's, uh, 
uh, it has marked a turning point in the history of international cooperation, and it seems that it's going to stay here for a little bit longer. Uh, this makes being in control even more challenging, as uh, now tax executives not only feel the pressure to constantly improve efficiency, grow revenue, or, or ensure their overall control, but they also need to find new ways on, on how to deal with uh, BEPS-related risks. Uh, this means that they need to think sharper and they need to have the right tools available or the right means available uh, uh, that would help them to deal with the increasing tax regulatory requirements. So uh, reacting to the, to the latest developments in the BEPS world, uh, TPA has developed a BEPS readiness uh, test uh, which help corporates uh, at a high level identify their readiness to comply with BEPS. In other words, uh, BEPS readiness test is here to help uh, corporates uh, in prioritizing the improvement initiatives and also BEPS readiness test serves uh, um, uh, as a starting point in, in developing actionable tax trends pricing risk management tactics. Having said that, let's move to the next slide uh, where we have uh, BEPS readiness uh, project steps uh, visualized. Um, so as you can see in this slide, the BEPS readiness test is structured into three major stages. Um, uh, very, briefly, very briefly, I'm going to guide you through all the stages. First of all, um, uh, what we do, uh, we, we ask corporates to, to share with us information up, up front, which we believe is showcasing their readiness to comply with BEPS. Uh, second, we run interview sessions with various uh, stakeholders within an organization being uh, finance, tax, transfer pricing, uh, uh, and commercial stakeholders as well. Uh, and finally, within 48 hours, uh, when we leave the premises of our, of, of our clients or, or when you finalize the interview sessions, we deliver the BEPS readiness report, uh, uh, which showcases uh, major risk areas and also provides uh, recommendations on how to mitigate those risks. Um, uh, let's take a closer look to our methodology. Um, uh, it can be best illustrated with the filter approach, as you can see in this slide. So first of all, uh, we first perform, perform an initial tax finding analysis, which allows us to get a general impression about corporate risk appetite, control framework, compliance efforts, etc. And when we have that general uh, uh, picture, we then move to a BEPS readiness test, a specific test, uh, um, uh, and with this BEPS readiness test, we capture insights across the organization by running structured interview sessions uh, facilitated by transfer pricing uh, professionals. Uh, and those interviews are based on a 15 BEPS action points approach. In total, I need to mention that we have around 60 questions. Um, and it is also important to say that uh, we ask uh, management board to share their view on those 60 questions and also we as TPA take a political and also technical assessment on the same questions and then we co compare, of course, uh, the, the analysis res the results and the perceived uh, impressions on, on those, on those uh, uh, BEPS action points and, and their risk profiles. So once we have the analysis results ready, uh, the final step, what we do, uh, we create a contingency plan uh, on how to mitigate those BEPS risk exposures that we identify during our analysis steps. And uh, we also help clients uh, uh, with uh, start moving the uh, transfer pricing governance to a risk-focused role, in other words, uh, what we do, we assist corporates in, uh, in defining the exact activity and a time planner. Um, now I will give a little bit more details on, on how the, the process works in, 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 in practice. So in this, is, uh, in this slide, you see the list of, uh, of information that we are asking uh, corporates to, to share with us up front. So what we are looking at, uh, and this is also uh, an initial fact-finding analysis, part of, part, of, part of the initial fact-finding analysis. 
So what we are looking at are like general uh, documents, organizational charts, code of conduct. We ask uh, functional descriptions, uh, of course, tax policy objectives. Uh, um, uh, we also look uh, at the number of substantial tax transpracting disputes over the last three years and, and also the dis short descriptions or brief descriptions of, of, of those. Um, uh, what we are also looking at, we are also asking if and in so far possible for headquarters to fill in country by country reporting. Um, more about the interviews uh, itself, uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, uh, so the typical interviews are structured in the following manner. Uh, uh, First of all, we, uh, we run a, a setting the scene interview with CFO and finance team to decide uh, or to share our views also on, on the major uh, BEPS risks uh, that we uh, came across during the uh, first tax fighting analysis and we also define the further interviewees. Uh, then we, we run a one hour interview sessions with the head of tax, head of CP, internal audit, also business unit leaders to get their perspective on, on the same questions. Lastly, uh, we have a, a, a final, uh, final or closing interview session um, uh, with management board uh, where we decide or, or take final positions on all those best action points. Um, uh, there is also to remind you that uh, we are CPA uh, uh, are also taking uh, uh, our view uh, technical and pol political on all those 16 uh, questions, 16 uh, uh, issues, uh, and then we compare those uh, the, those uh, analysis results and based on that provide uh, provide recommendations which uh, uh, best uh, risks to address now, which issues are not so so urgent, uh, urgent, etc. Uh, so just to give you a feeling of what kind of questions we are running uh, during our interview session, um, uh, we give you an illustration on on the BEPS, uh, on the first BEPS action point, digital economy. Uh, so uh, in this slide, you can see that you can get questions like, to what extent does your core business of the enterprise rely on digital goods or digital services? And the answers, uh, or the answer to, to this question in particular, um, um, uh, triggers um, uh, consequences for low, medium, or uh, high risk profiles. So, if you say, for example, or you have an answer that yes, uh, uh, a significant part of the core business actually relies on digital goods and digital services, that means that uh, that you run a high risk and. Uh, um, That means that you that you run a, a high risk, um, and obviously, as I already mentioned, uh, the whole approach here is that a management board takes an explicit position on all these questions. Then, on the other hand, uh, TPA takes, politi takes political and, and technical assessment. And if you ended up with uh, uh, with the same view that it's a high uh, risk, you need to start acting immediately start uh, creating a contingency plan on, on, on how to mitigate those risks. Of course, if you, if you come up with a different assessment than a management board, you need to start also talking about it and communicate that. So if we add all these results, uh, uh, all, all the answers to those 60 questions that I was uh, mentioning earlier, um, uh, it leads to a mapping of a management board perceived risks and GPA perceived risks. Uh, so let's take high-tech companies example once again, uh, uh, and as you can see, um, uh, that's actually point one is a high risk above uh, a few others, uh, with uh, action point thirteen uh, as well, which is talking about country by country reporting. The assessment that we are pe uh, performing also leads to some insights. Uh, that are highlighted uh, uh, in the, uh, on the right side of the of this slide, and, and those insights also uh, uh, land in, in our BEPS readiness report. Um, so this is uh, from my side, and now I'm happy to hand it over to, to Raymond. He will illustrate some recommendation recommendation areas of attention. Thank you, Igna. As Igna mentioned. What we are doing with our clients is basically a risk review. 
it's a, it's a methodology that we apply uh, where we want to understand how does your organization look at itself but we obviously also want to make a, a statement and, and have a review and a, a judgment on it ourselves. The example that we have here on, the, on this slide, um, it's just hypothetical, but when we see, for instance, that you have hybrid mismatch or, uh, arrangements in place, very obvious, everybody knows it's a problem, so you're gonna have to take an action. And all we do is highlight it, document it, and come up with uh, a next step where you need to go and have a look at how you can uh, amend it. In the area of interest deductions and other financial payments, clearly we would expect a number of countries to have that issue because it's part of normal business in today's world, so it probably means your action will be around having to identify all countries where you have financing arrangements in place, analyze your limitation elements, analyze your risk, and then come up with the remediation. Um, same on harmful tax practices. I don't want to go through each and every one of them. You can read it on the, uh, on the slides. It is an example of those action points that we want to uh, address with you, discuss what did we find, how do we believe you run a risk and why, and what is it that you should be doing uh, is then the next step for, for debate and discussion. The same on the next slide. Uh, with PEs, cross-border transactions, uh, around methods applied, in particular one for, um, uh, for commodity traders and CBC reporting, etc. So if we go more towards the conclusive part, which is the slide number 22, what is it in for you, Ignit? you want to have a first go at, the, at, at this? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. So. Um, uh, in summary, I, I would uh, like to leave you with the message that PEP's uh, readiness test is a fast structured and at the same time straightforward mean of, on, 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 uh, of assessing uh, corporate readiness to comply with PEP. And at the same time, it uh, serves uh, as a guide as to what immediate actions uh, need to be taken to move closer to the beam in control status. In other words, uh, BEPS readiness uh, a test broadens corporate understanding uh, of the compliance risks, also challenges, uh, constantly challenges their thinking on how this risk should be mitigated, and also, uh, uh, as already uh, stated, uh, assists in developing actionable tax enterprise and risk management tactics. That would be all from my side. And Raymond, do you have anything to add on that? I think if you look at the bottom, it's what I said already earlier. Um, CBC is one of those things that is going to be the first time when, uh, when your organization is going to have to report everything it does in line with expectations of information the authorities have, meaning all action points, one or the other way, will find their way into CBC. Since the reports that you will have to file relate to financial year 2016, it means that anything that you have not taken out of the equation by that time will be in principle part of what you have to report, meaning that can create a risk. So, you know, your your timeline is not January 2017 in my humble view, but it is 1st of January 2016, which gives you another seven months. I think it is fair to say that BEBS is here. If you rewind and go back two years from now, uh, two, two, three years ago, I, w I was personally a bit skeptical and I was thus also a bit surprised uh, last year when there was consensus around 44 countries on all these reports, meaning that BEPS has arrived. Uh, today, uh, I'm looking at it a little bit more skeptical. Yes, BEPS has arrived. Yes, the concepts of what tax authorities want to attack have arrived. Yes, they are taking action. No, not yet in a coordinated way, but in a unilateral way, which means it's even getting more complicated. And the risk of double taxation is, uh, is becoming higher. With that in mind, for you as a tax department, it's even getting yeah, even more difficult, if I will, more challenging, because you're going to have to handle more complex issues within your organization. They are operational in nature, they are financial reporting in nature, which are not typical the areas that the tax department has a mandate for. 
meaning it has to convince senior management first that there is a high level of need to do things differently compared to what was yesterday or even today, which means how can you manage your mentioned by Ling at the start, you can start putting your questions into the chat box and uh, we will try to, uh, to answer some of the questions that you have. Um, Do we have questions, Ling? Yes, great. We already have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, the first one, um, does it have countries which implement the CBC earlier than financial year 2016? To our knowledge, there, is, there, there are no countries that, um, that have yet introduced CBC for the financial year before 2016. Even those countries that have come up with own rules, and I believe it was like uh, Spain and the UK have introduced rules. Uh, it's all related to financial year 2016 as far as I'm aware. Okay. Um, and we have another question uh, regarding CBC reporting. Practically speaking, do we know if we are to include foreign exchange gains and losses within the income figure? Do we offset gains with losses? Do we include realized and unrealized foreign exchange gains? That's a very practical question, and I can see that uh, people are working on this uh, actively as these questions are popping up. In my view, the way we look at uh, CBC reporting, we are advising our clients to stay away from looking at the tax numbers. We are recommending more to create CBC reporting based on those financials that an organization use for consolidation purposes. So in other words, if your financial standard is IFRS, then we would recommend using that standard to uh, to report all the information that would be relevant to the legal entities in the, in the specific countries that you operate and thus use those accounting rules to include what has to be in the uh, in the p and l uh, under those accounting rules and if that means fx is a line item that you have to report then then the answer is yes if it's not or if it's just pulled into the um, uh, the interest section, then it is uh, part of the interest section. Uh, that's where I would recommend companies to go momentarily. Any other questions? Um, we have another question. What if the parent company accepts CBC reporting, but the subsidiary is yet thinking of adopting or will adopt in future? How should this be addressed? That's a good question. I like the question. It's a challenging one, but you know, I think if uh, if CBC is accepted throughout the countries that have signed up to the BEPS reports, in particular on this one on 13, then all those countries have that obligation, or in those countries you have the obligation to report, which means if you have a subsidiary there, that has to report as well. Um, how does it work the other way around if you have a subsidiary in another country where there is no such thing but the parent is in that in, in that area then it's a, it's a question mark I don't know the answer to that one and I think you're gonna have to take a position in your organization to see how it best works um, I think the same person is asking a question around the penalties if we do not adhere to CBC timelines. I'm not aware of penalties having been introduced. I think it's, um, it's, it's a matter of tax authorities. If you do not, well, let me rephrase my, my answer. CBC is probably going to become part of your documentation requirements for TP rules. If that's the case, the TP rule set around if you do not comply with your TP rules will be applicable and that will then differ from country to country whether you have contemporaneous requirements for reporting, whether it's part of your tax return filing, etc. And all the penalties, I could assume, that apply to not timely uh, complying with those requirements will create uh, an issue potentially for you that can trigger penalties. 
because you have simply not met your compliance requirements as per the law. That's as general as I can answer that question most likely. All right, we have some new questions. How will BAPS modify the TP report against the actual OECD guidelines? Maybe that's a, a discussion we probably want to take offline, but in general, uh, in the general context, you will have to look at today, OECD is looking at one-sided. So you look at one side of the transaction and that's a tested party approach. For the future, as an example, you will also have to look at the other side. What is the other side of the transaction doing? And is then the split in the way that income is split between the two parties, is that the fair approach? That's why there is a discussion going on whether profit split methods are becoming more uh, relevant in this world or whether we can still apply some of the well-known rules. Uh, so yes, there is already uh, a change in terms of how your documentation needs to be picked up. The other element is if you look at conduct as one of those elements and substance, uh, no doubt you need to find yourself a way to document yourself into the roles and the, the activities and risks of these individuals on both sides of the transaction, which means there is additional elements to, to be considered. But I'm more than happy to take that one offline if, uh, if that makes sense, and we're more than happy to, to have a further discussion on that. Sorry, there's another one. Yes, we have another question. Would we include tax refunds received in the tax payments made box in the CBC report? Again, I think that's an answer that will be driven, and at least that's my recommendation to my clients, that the answer is driven by what is your accounting treatment for uh, taxes. So if the tax payments made is based on IFRS, and it is a, um, a, an income tax, and if the refund is, is also an income tax, you can net it as far as I'm concerned, because that's the way I would report it on my, uh, on my uh, balance sheet, um, so, or in my cash statement. Uh, so I would say yes, that would be my recommendation. Um, which countries will be benefiting most from the BAPS project? Jesus Christ, that's a crystal ball. Um, I think what we see, if you look at the treaties, and if you look at United Nations countries, not the OECD countries, I think United Nations countries are, to a certain extent, a bit hampered because of tax treaties they concluded they are seeing a lot of money going out with low withholding taxes. They obviously want to get their withholding taxes back. So if you look at the, the treaty abuse, Article, uh, Action 5, they, uh, sorry, Action 6, they would want to have more money. So they are, they are chasing after that. Um, what are the other countries? We all know that there are countries like France, if you think about commissioner structures, we know about the UK. If you look at the PE, Australia now, uh, they all want to have a bit of a, a barrier against organizations being able to move income to low tax jurisdictions. Um, will they benefit from that? That is almost like a macroeconomic question. So if you think about Ireland, Switzerland, maybe having principal or you know low taxes with uh, not a lot of activity maybe and maybe that's too much said I'm just thinking out loud here they might lose because there may be not as much income attributed into those countries anymore as the uh, multinationals had anticipated and the originating countries will retain more of that income thus get more taxation so you need to look at those countries where then this value comes from, which could be production, which could be R&D on the contract, which could be manufacturing on the contract. Those countries might get more of their share than what they have today. Do we have any more questions? Yeah? Yes. Uh, what kind of measures can we expect from uh, a multilateral instrument? That's action 15. Um, in a way, it's, it is obviously, again, a crystal ball in terms of what is, what is actually going to be agreed between all the countries that are going to be part of this multilateral uh, arrangement. Um, so it's very difficult to say what is really going to materialize. Um, 
yeah, I think that's probably the answer. It, it is it is a crystal ball momentarily uh, on, on what actually finds its way into this multilateral agreement. Clear is that one of the drivers must be the um, the treaty abuse because that would be the one where all these countries have an interest in having that treaty abuse curbed and this is probably the very quick and fast way to do it. Um, other areas, PE might be coming in, uh, that's going to be contentious uh, because obviously you, you, you heard the question earlier, you know, which countries are benefiting? Difficult to say but, you know, everybody will protect its base and PE is a very easy way to lose money to another country if they are successfully getting the uh, the PE considerations into this uh, agreement. But PE would probably be one of it, as well as, um, uh, I would say, um, the interest, the way the, 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 the countries will have to look at interest. Okay, anything else? All right, um, that will be the end of our presentation. Um, so if you have any other questions you want to discuss offline, you can send an email to Raymond or Ignaz, and we will upload the presentation slides and the recorded session to our website, and we will get emails after uh, the materials are available for download. Thank you for attending our webinar. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.